Kate Hennessy is a writer whose most recent work, Dorothy Day, The World Will Be Saved by Beauty, An Intimate Portrait of My Grandmother, won a Christopher Award for helping to, quote, affirm the highest values of the human spirit. Thank you. Good evening. I come from a long line of storytellers. My grandmother was a storyteller. This is something that I, I really want people to know about her, is that not only was she a very good writer and a very prolific writer, but she was an excellent storyteller, and so was my mother. So I just con consider myself, you know, in this lineage of, of storytellers in my family. The life of my grandmother is extraordinary. I mean, the, every, every important event in U.S. history of the 20th century my grandmother was somehow involved with. Here at the Catholic Worker, we know each other in the breaking of heads. <laughs> or, uh, here at the Catholic Worker, we don't have a single cockroach. They're all married with children. <laughs> See, so, you know, very corny. What else? Some of the few others. Oh, here at the Catholic Worker, we have room for everyone, as long as you don't mind sleeping 13 to a bed. <laughs> or, um, here at the Catholic Worker, we change our sheets every day from one bed to another. <laughs> anyway, this is the genesis of everything that my grandmother did, was from a deep sense of gratitude. And that gratitude came from the birth of my mom in 1926. Um, as many of you may know, my grandmother had an abortion when she was about 22 years old, and it was an incredibly dangerous and um, traumatic abortion, and uh, she almost died, and she was certain that she would never have a child, never be able to have a child ever again. But six years later, she became pregnant, and she gave birth, 1926, um, to my mom, Tamar. And this was an event of such great import to her. This was a, a, a moment of such sacredness that she was not going to squander, that um, she, was, she, she felt she had to do something with her life. And up until this point, she was, she was a journalist. That was her work. And she remained. She always believed that her work was a journalist. That was her vocation, to be a writer. And she was a prolific writer. She wrote at least five books, I think six books, some which weren't published. Um, she wrote 50 years of columns, um, articles, um, really a, an immense amount of diary writing. I mean, she was a, a prolific writer. And, um, and so she was, she was just so, so um, I don't know, changed by the birth of her daughter that, um, she, well, what she did was, she went and had my mother baptized in the Catholic Church. And uh, this is, goes to show just what a kind of um, paradoxical and com complex person my grandmother was, because at that point, neither she nor, of course, um, my grandfather, Foster Batram, were members of the Catholic Church. So um, how many people get their child baptized in a church that neither parent belongs to? But um, this is my grandmother's. This is my paradoxical, complicated, um, difficult um, grandmother. And uh, she did eventually, about six months later, enter the Catholic Church. And um, there was a great period of, of um, turmoil for her because she had had a, a real strong backing. Her work as a journalist had been totally involved in the radical movements at the time in New York City, particularly in Greenwich Village, both the radical movements and the literary movements. She was really, at, even though she was very young at the time, she was only in her teens and 20s, early 20s, she was um, at the forefront of all the, the, um, the strikes, the um, demonstrations, the, the, the movements, the radical movements of the time that were um, uh, you know, pushing for, for social justice. And um, so this was an incredibly delicate moment for her, you know, becoming a Catholic because of this, this mystery. I mean, a lot of people would ask her, what happened to you? What happened to you to, to lead you to convert to Catholicism? You know, people really want to know. And, um, you know, and she wrote several books about it. 
Uh, she wrote, um, The Long Loneliness is the, is the most famous of her books, but she wrote a, a couple before that, in which she really tried to chew this thing out. And she finally had to say in her 70s, she says, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. It was a mystery. And she said, well, I, I kind of feel like I should have been paying better attention at the time. But I really like this sense that she didn't understand what really moved her to in the in the path that, that um, she went on. Um, all her friends were still very much in, you know, involved in, in um, all these efforts of, of social justice, and um, she didn't know what she could do. She continued working as um, a writer and a few others. She always kind of cobbled together a living with various projects as she was raising her daughter, my mother, Tamar. And it wasn't until 1932 that something happened to her that really changed her direction. She went down to D.C. to cover a hunger march. And this was December 1932. It was at the, um, the height of the Great Depression. Total upheaval everywhere across the U.S. New York City alone had millions of unemployed people and homeless people. They had these tent cities everywhere. And so there was a, um, this huge, huge hunger march that was organized by her old radical friends. And she went down to cover this for America Magazine and Commonweal Magazine. And um, she's standing there watching her old friends, her old uh, communists and socialists and IWW friends and anarchist friends walking by. And she was like, you know, where are the Catholics? Why aren't we fighting for social justice? And um, so she went to the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception and the National Shrine in DC and she prayed to the Blessed Mother, what do I do? What do I do? And then she went back to New York, um, went back to my mom. She had a job, a research job. And within a few days, she met a man, Peter Morn, who was a French peasant, um, ex-Christian brother, comes, came from a long line of um, French farmers. They actually, his, the, the Morn family still own the old family land in France. As far as I know, they still own it. And they've owned this land for 1,400 years. So this deeply rooted peasant who um, found himself in New York City and was sent down to meet my grandmother by the, um, the then editor of Commonweal Magazine, who said, I think you should meet Dorothy Day. You'll find someone who will be interested in what you're talking about. At this point, my grandmother had heard nothing about the church's teachings of, uh, on social justice. And she didn't know that there was any such thing. Peter arrives with his, he had this, he owned nothing. He was, he was an extraordinary man. He absolutely believed in voluntary poverty. He only owned the clothes on his back and he had, his coat had big pockets that he could fit books in. And that was it. He worked as a day laborer. He was incredibly well intelligent, uh, incredibly well educated, um, read everything. and um, and went to, to my grandmother. He also was a nonstop talker. Actually, they both were nonstop talkers. My grandmother loved to talk. Um, and he said, well, here are the teachings of the church. Here are the social teachings of the church. Here are the teachings of the church fathers. Here are the encyclicals. Here it is. Um, and this was just an, a moment, uh, um, an incredible moment for my grandmother, because finally she had this synthesis of her, her newly found faith and her old radical drive to be of some service in the world towards social justice. And this combination, you know, my mother always said, you know, Peter Morn opened the door to my grandmother by saying, here, here it is, here's the basis, and she ran with it. And um, my grandmother would also say that, you know, Peter had the ideas and the ideal deals, but, um, but my grandmother put meat on the bones of, of his ideals by starting the Catholic Worker. Now, the Worker did not start as the movement that we know it today. Um, you know, houses of hospitality, soup lines, um, uh, getting arrested, very important part of the Catholic Worker tradition you know, um, protesting against unjust laws and ending up in prison. Um, at this time, 
all she thought of, I have to write a paper, I'm a writer, I'm a journalist, I know how to lay out a paper, I know how to do this, and we have to get the word out to people that the church does have a program for social justice. And so that's, the, that's how it all started, was just with a paper. And they went out to May, the, the Union Square on May Day, 1933, which was really when, really was the, probably the worst year of the Great Depression, 1933. The entire country was just in, in um, tatters, um, people starving, people moving here and there, leaving their farms, um, people coming, you know, streaming into the cities. And, um, and so on May 1st, she started handing out, she and a couple of other fellows started handing out the paper, the Catholic worker paper, selling it for a penny a copy. And they were standing right next to the, um, the Communist Party members who were selling the Daily Worker. Um, and speaking of Stanley, he, he used to, when he went to, to sell the paper, you know, the, 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 the people selling the Daily Worker would say, read the Daily Worker. And uh, Stanley would say, read the Worker Daily. <laughs> Confuse people. He would also say, when he'd see my grandmother walking towards him while he's selling papers, he'd suddenly say, read the Catholic Worker, romance on every page. <laughs> Peter had a three-pronged program that he wanted to, to um, endorse, that he wanted to start. The first was Houses of Hospitality. And this was not meant for, for them to start. The Houses of Hospitality were meant for the bishops to open up. And this was in the tradition that, that Peter knew of, of in Europe. It was the, the bishops, particularly in the Middle Ages, that opened up houses of hospitality. So he, his idea was, we tell the bishops they need to open up houses of hospitality. That was the idea. The second um, platform that he had was um, um, what he called um, clarification of thought, roundtable discussions. He believed that each of us has the obligation, no matter what our level of education, no matter what our class, where we come from, we each have the ability and the obligation to learn our history, to figure out what's happening in the present, and to work how we want to change the future. So that was the, the second platform, the uh, piece of the platform. And the third was the farming communes, that this was kind of like the answer to this, this, this um, turmoil and hopelessness of homelessness and unemployment, he says. We have to go back to the land. There is no unemployment on the land. Um, this is, this, you know, people desire to return to the land. Now, of course, as I mentioned, he was from a long line of uh, French farmers, peasants, so he understood that. My grandmother was a city person, and she didn't really, I mean, she kind of uh, liked the idea, but she didn't really understand what it, what it meant. Now, my mother understood it completely from the age of seven. Um, she really had a very close relationship with Peter and really understand that vision of the farm and commune. Now, all these things are still with us today. The bishops never did open the houses of hospitality. And what happened was that people showed up at her doorstep, at Dorothy's doorstep, and said, so what is it about these houses of hospitality that you're writing about? Where are they? And of course, you know, my grandmother was like not going to turn people away and say, well, we can write about it, but we're not going to do this. She had to do something, and that was the beginning of both the soup line and the, um, the houses in which people could live. And in the beginning, it was just like um, a very simple. She just opened up her kitchen in her apartment. She rented a few apartments in um, the East Village in New York City in Manhattan. And that was the beginning. Well, be careful of what you start. Within three years, the paper had gone from an issue of 2,500 um, copies to 160,000 copies. It was going all over the country. The Houses of Hospitality had opened up in at least half a dozen major cities across the country. The Catholic Worker, as a movement, had started, and it hasn't stopped since. Um, she's, my grandmother died in, in 1980, 38 years ago, and the Catholic Worker movement, as many of you know in this room, um, is vibrant. It's still happening. And the miracle is, the mystery is, my favorite word, mystery, the mystery is, is this is not an organization. There is nothing organized about the Catholic worker. <laughs> it, is a, it is a movement 
or as Peter would say, it's an organism, not an organization. You know, there's no membership, you don't join, there's no formal declaration, there's no bylaws that you have to, have to follow, there's nothing that you have to declare. The only thing that you have to say to be a Catholic worker is, I'm a Catholic worker, and I'm going to um, do what I can following the works of mercy. That's it. I mean, the works of mercy were my grandmother's marching orders, and um, all these communities around the country, and there are at least 200 of them. I don't know how many there are. It's always changing. A lot of people don't claim to be Catholic workers, but it's like, I recognize you, you know, whether or not you claim to be one. And um, so there, this, this, it's, a gen it's a genius, actually, you know, that it's so unorganized that all it takes, and this is a very important part of Peter's program, is personal responsibility personalism. You see what needs to be done and you do it. Um, and this has really um, spoken to so many people. I've just been privileged to meet people all over the country that have been influenced by my grandmother. Um, you know, that there's a, um, I like to say, for years I've been saying, you know, to have known Dorothy Day is to, spe to, to spend the rest of your life wondering what hit you. And um, I have heard from so many people during this, this travels of talking about my book who you know, have come up to me and said, I met your grandmother once when I was 18 years old for 10 minutes, and my life has not been the same since. I meet people who say, oh, I'm an ex-Catholic worker, and I look at them and I say, yeah, right. No such thing as an ex-Catholic worker. Once, once you open your mind and your consciousness to what she is saying, you are never changed. And I'm no exception to that. Um, none of us, none, no one in my family is an exception to that. You know, she famously said, and a lot of people ask me, well, you know, she said that, that one quote, you know, don't call me a saint. I don't want to be dismissed so easily. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I can totally hear her saying this. I mean, I, she had a sharp tongue, and she didn't suffer fools gladly. And um, so I, I, you know, I have no doubt that, that, um, that she said that. But I also, I think I understand why she said that. You know, she revered saints. They were important to her even before she became Catholic. They were really the beginning of, of her conversion process was reading the lives of the saints. My mother used to say that it took her a long time to realize that actually in life you were meant to kind of figure out what you're meant to do and, and go out and get a job and pay the bills that way. She said, for the longest time I thought you just prayed to St. Joseph and he would pay the bills. <laughs> My grandmother used to do this whenever they were like behind on any of the bills of the Catholic worker, she would take the bill and she would wrap it around their statue of St. Joseph and say, you deal with this. <laughs> We each have a calling. We each have something that we're meant to do. Do not use this as an excuse, you know, to put someone to say, you know, that, oh, that's impossible for me. She can do it. I can't do it. She provokes us, you know. She provokes each of us. She makes us uncomfortable. What I'd like to do now is share with you these nine lessons, and I'm still working on these, you know. I am no different than anyone else in terms of trying to discern what my grandmother has to say to me. because She really does ask each of us some pretty hard questions about who we are and what we're meant to do here um, with our life, with the life that's given us. Number one, make yourself uncomfortable, deeply uncomfortable. She will really provoke you into thinking, well, what, what am I doing with my life? You know, how, how am I being lazy in what I believe and what I, how I'm acting? How am I being lazy with my opinions? And I think this is one thing that um, she really tried hard to push against. We have a lot of opinions of who we think people are, you know, and why they're poor, or, you know, why they're suffering, why they're in prison. Um, why do we need to help them um, when they won't help themselves? There's all these, all these things, and she says, do not waste any time on opinions. 
you know, find out from people, get to know each other. She said, you know, that she did not see the face of God except for in the faces of others, which is a very powerful statement, especially the poor, she said. She said, you know, the, the coat that hangs in, the, in your closet belongs to the poor. If you're not using it, give it to someone else. The second lesson um, is follow your conscience. Because she was very clear, there is no such thing as a just war. That Jesus told us to love our enemies. And she said, we have to trust him. We have to trust Jesus. And, um, but these young men are caught in, in a very difficult position. And so she said, you have to examine your conscience as best as you can. And even if it's, it's best it, that it's an informed conscience that you study the issue, but even if you don't, you still follow your conscience. And she said, you know, sometimes the only, I mean, how do you know what your conscience is telling you? And sometimes she said, well, it'll just keep coming back again and again and again. That voice will keep coming back. And my, my brother decided to go to Vietnam. He decided to, call, to follow his conscience in that direction. Number three, and this one I actually love, number three. Find your vocation. Both my grandmother and my mother really believed in the importance of each of us finding our vocations, and they did not talk about career. This had nothing to do with career. This had to do with finding out what you and you alone were meant to do. Two things that she said about finding your vocation. One is, you will know your vocation by the joy it brings you. Very first thing she said. The second thing she said is, and it's good if you can put this vocation within the context of the works of mercy. But she says it's not essential. That first part is the joy that it brings you. And I kind of believe, I believe that um, with that joy, if you tap into that joy, it will become a work of mercy because it will become a, 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 a point of great joy for others too. It'll, be so, it'll become something that you are giving to others. Number four, don't be afraid. And this was an incredibly important one for her in her later years. The very last talk that she ever gave at a public, a public talk, which was in front of 8,000 people in Philadelphia in 1976, and she spoke alongside of Mother Teresa at that time. This was a big thing. And uh, the only topic that she could think of, she was 79 years old, you know, she was coming to the end of um, a, an incredibly long and uh, powerful and um, rich life. And the one, th one thing that she wanted to impart was be not afraid. She said, we are afraid of so many things and it really controls our behavior. We're afraid of losing our jobs. We're afraid of losing our reputation. We're afraid of, of um, losing you know, um, our family or losing the, the goodwill of others. We're afraid, you know, we're bodily, we're afraid of bodily harm. She says, there's so many ways that we can be afraid. And she says, we still have to go ahead. We cannot let fear stop us. And we cannot let the fear of failure stop us. She said, you have to expect failure in this kind of work. She felt that she was a huge failure. Um, and she said, you still have to keep going. You still have to, um, you have to expect it. And you have to stop the reliance on outcomes, which I think is what we have kind of slid ourselves into in this world, that everything has to have an outcome. She says, you, got, you have to look at the long view. You may not know what your actions will result in. You never know. Um, but you can't, ex and you can't expect to see the results. Number five, see beauty, no matter how difficult it may be. She was a genius at seeing beauty. I mean, she, um, Catholic worker houses were always in the worst of neighborhoods, and the, the houses themselves neat, were in dreadful condition. And um, she had this genius for always pulling out the little bits of beauty that she could find, you know, whether it was a, a tree or the sunlight or clouds or a flower or a person or, you know, a dish or a piece of music or a book. I mean, she just had this incredible um, sensitivity and awareness of beauty. And that's, you know, the reason why I called my book, The World Will Be Saved by Beauty, which is a quote from Dostoevsky. He, um, this is in the book, his novel, The Idiot. 
the world would be saved by beauty. And when I read my grandmother's diaries, which came out um, two weeks after my mother's death in 2008, um, I, I learned that in the later years of her life, in the last like two or three years of her life, this is one of the phrases that she woke up to in the morning. Very first thing she would hear in her, in her mind was, the world will be saved by beauty. And at that time, when I was reading her diaries, I was really in the midst of my grief for losing my mother. And for some reason, that phrase, that sentence, just, just opened my heart wide open. And I thought, yes. And I want this book to be called The World to Be Saved by Beauty. And it's a miracle that the publisher kept that title. Number six, love one another, especially the undeserving. Not easy. <laughs> It is not easy at all. We have, a, we have a hard time loving people in our own families, don't we? And um, both my mother and my grandmother had an incredible notion, a heroic sense of family. You know, not just the, the uh, relations, but they both just expanded the sense of family for me to, to encompass this huge community of, of souls, um, which I think is, is also absolutely essential to us in this day and age, back then and now, that we can't just think about our own, that we have to expand our sense of who family is. Number seven, never give up. She said that um, she came to believe that faithfulness and perseverance were of the greatest virtues. And both she and my mother lived very difficult lives, and they never gave up absolutely never gave up. And um, an incredibly hard lesson to learn. She said that, you know, we make, we make mistakes. We make, sometimes we make colossal mistakes. But that still doesn't give us the right to give up. Number eight, laugh a lot. Um, both she and my mother had fabulous sense of humor. And they really were quite joyous. Um, even in the worst of times, they could find something to laugh about. And they just had these wonderful, infectious giggles. And their eyes would light up. They just had these, both of them had these very piercing blue eyes. And um, it was just such a delight. Number nine, absolutely essential. Pray a lot. Pray unceasingly. Um, and she had quite a vigorous prayer life, a spiritual life, and it was a very broad notion of prayer. It was not only reading scripture, it was not only doing, you know, formal prayers. It was reading whatever opened up her spiritually. It was listening to music. She was a great lover of opera. Um, it was, you know, writing. She considered writing as a form of prayer, and she would um, wake up early every morning, five o'clock, and spend the first three hours of her day in prayer. Um, she says, you cannot do anything, you cannot do any of this work without prayer. So, nine lessons from Granny. Dorothy is in danger of being lost in all her wild and varied ways, her complexities, her contradictions, and the sense of power that defies description. The look, as Tamar described it, with those beautiful and devastating eyes, darting and intense. Her voice, the one she has left for us, is beautiful, simple, simple, and evocative. But then sometimes there is the lecturing, the defensiveness, and the piety. Often it feels as if she tried hard to efface herself. This was partly for good reasons. She was fierce, dictatorial, controlling, judgmental, and often angry, and she knew it. It took the Catholic worker, her own creation, to teach her her lessons. In my struggles to know the nature of her gifts, I hold on to my relics of her. I hoard my beliefs, my stories, my memories, and those things I have like her marked copy of the Imitation of Christ and the hand-woven Bolivian bag she wore when arrested for the last time at the age of 76. Others, too, hold on for dear life to their Dorothy stories, their Dorothy connection, their Dorothy relics. Stop it, she says. Look to yourselves. Do the work. But what is the work? 
Dorothy never said that everyone should work on the soup line. She loved people's vocations and occupations and found so much beauty in our desire to work and create.